going to go Facebook Live. And then I'll let everybody in and start welcoming. Okay, I'm going to admit everybody. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think some folks are joining us now. I'd like to welcome everybody to, um, I guess, the third part of our energy savings um, series with, Ener with uh, Centurion Technologies. My name is Ashley Barger, I'm in marketing, and I just wanted to go over a little housekeeping with everybody as I kind of admit everybody into today's webinar. I wanna let you know that today's meeting is being recorded. Um, so please um, disengage your video if you do not want that to be um, shown on the recording. Um, the recording will be made available on Centurion Technologies website following today. It'll also be available on the Facebook page. Um, I wanted to let you know that you are able to ask questions whenever you have questions. Use the chat feature um, that's at the bottom middle of your Zoom screen. Please chat your questions. I will interrupt our presenter um, to ensure that those questions are answered in a timely manner. You may hold them to the end um, if you'd like to. We can do the Q&A at the end, but we're happy to interrupt and make sure those um, questions are answered um, as quickly as possible. So getting started today, I wanted to um, first acknowledge and introduce um, uh, Craig Kuchbaugh. He's the owner of Centurion Technologies, and he has um, made this possible today. Um, he is a consultant in the energy saving sector. So good morning, Craig. Good morning, Ashley. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us on our webinar series with in regards to the future of energy and what Centurion can do for you. We've had a list of extremely good speakers and knowledgeable people. Today is nonetheless uh, some, of, some of the best people that we can absolutely get in the fuel cell energy market, as well as been in the energy market. Mark Fiesel has spent his lifetime around energy um, as have I, but Mark's a lot smarter. So Mark, Mark puts a wonderful presentation on and we're looking forward to Mark sharing his knowledge with all of you. Thanks, Craig. And I guess without uh, further ado, I definitely want to introduce you today to Mark Fiesel. Um, he has immense knowledge as Craig mentioned. So Mark, if you don't mind, please introduce yourself. All right, that sounds like a pretty uh, pr pretty high bar there. So thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Craig, for kicking us off there. Uh, and I'm happy to introduce myself. In fact, I'll pull up the presentation and getting it going so that uh, that we can do that. Awesome. So uh, yeah, my name is Mark Fiesel. Uh, I am with uh, Fuel Cell Energy. Uh, but I'll start a little farther back in terms of my background. Um, I've been in energy for a long time. There's a picture to me. Uh, of me back in 1990 aboard a nuclear submarine. I was responsible for the electrical systems associated with the reactor plant and, uh, you know, generally living the life of a sailor. And so thankfully we didn't have cell phones or uh, social media back then. Uh, but uh, that really was the beginning of my career in energy, focusing on uh, that uh, operations of that nuclear reactor. Right now I lead commercial activities for fuel cell energy. I'm going to go into a little bit who we are. I'm not going to spend a ton of time uh, making this presentation a, a commercial. Instead, I'm going to talk a little more about the technologies, but I'm happy to share with you um, separately uh, information about our company and what we do and and uh, what we what we think is important in the market today. I'm an also an adjunct professor at Northwestern Institute for Energy and Sustainability. It's a master's degree program, uh, generally attended by um, engineers from the McCormick School or business people from Kellogg. Uh, so we get a wide array of legal, technical, financial folks that come uh, and work on a postgraduate degree to really focus and make a difference in the space of energy and sustainability. I've been doing that for, for three years. 
Uh, and finally, uh, I spent around 20 years at Schneider Electric, building business around power management, electric utilities, and microgrid. So I've got a lot of experience with Schneider uh, and a lot of great experiences with uh, the colleagues I had at that time, building those businesses, some of which are probably here with us today. Um, a little bit about fuel cell energy. So we've been in, uh, we were founded in 1969. So if, if you think back in that time frame, you, you may not have been around then, but uh, we weren't using words necessarily like, uh, 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 you know, greenhouse gas, uh, uh, carbon footprint. Uh, instead, some of the thoughts and terminology were around acid rain or smog. You may recall pictures of smog over Los Angeles or other major cities. So the U.S. federal government and other entities began to really focus on what can we do about this. Uh, most of our energy at that time was was uh, was what resulted from the combustion of fossil fuel, uh, and fossil fuels are something we have an abundance here in the U.S. Uh, so the thought was around how can we use that fossil fuel, but really um, do so in a more responsible way. In this idea of unleashing the energy that's in fossil fuel not via combustion, but instead via an electrochemical reaction uh, that uh, would result in electricity without that particulate and nitrous oxide and sulfur dioxide that, that results in those greenhouse gases, uh, results in uh, smog, uh, results in acid rain uh, was the focus. And that was the very genesis of this, uh, of this company. Uh, it was one of the few companies that actually successfully uh, commercialized uh, a platform that became known as a fuel cell. So we began all the way back then. Uh, we commercialized our first technology, uh, the molten carbonate fuel cell around 2003 and went public uh, just a little before then. So we're uh, listed on the NASDAQ today. So if you want to know all about us and our financials, you can, um, you can look it up there. Uh, today we're around 450 employees, we manufacture in U.S., Canada, and Germany. Our headquarters are in Danbury, Connecticut. Our largest factory is in Torrington, Connecticut. And we've got platforms uh, all around the world, which I'll share in just a little bit. Um, beginning, as you can imagine, in 1969, studying this very technical challenge of electrochemical production electricity, you can imagine that we're a science-heavy company. And indeed, we've got in excess of 600 patents around some of these ideas. Um, who we are today really can be described at, in, in two different ways. Uh, number one, um, decarbonized power. Uh, we, can, we can create electricity in a way that has very low or no carbon content, and we can capture the CO2 content from other emitting sources. We'll be talking about that carbon capture quite a bit in this presentation. The other thing that we really focus on today is producing hydrogen, uh, which once again, we're really gonna be digging into today, so I won't talk about it now, but decarbonized power, producing hydrogen, that really is the center of who we are. And in doing so, we work with a lot of world-class organizations, some of them on the right, uh, it's a list that's uh, growing by the day. I'll reference a couple of these as, as we go along today. Um, you know, as I mentioned, having been around since that long, uh, uh, commercializing offer in 2003, we're not just some PowerPoint uh, company. So the things I'll talk to you about today, um, we can talk about, you know, how they exist in the field today, uh, where they've been deployed and how, but you can imagine that across the world. So the, the first project there is a, a project in Korea. Uh, you can see behind the meter applications with people like Pfizer. Uh, you can see um, grid support, um, you know, uh, independent power producer type uh, scenarios, um, leveraging brownfield sites. And then um, the final one is this, this newer world, world where we're in today, uh, being able to create microgrids that uh, consist of energy that we create, but along with that, maybe um, solar, battery, wind, et cetera. So examples across all of those many sites, um, nearly all of them still in operation today. So I like to start, even though the title of this is the is is the is the future of energy. I think it's a little instructive to help us think about the history of energy uh, and to really get a sense on how fast things are changing today. Because uh, an incredible change is occurring at this point. If you look all the way back to the beginning of this graph, 1800, you can imagine before then it, it stretches on and on. But the uh, you know, for thousands of years, uh, energy was created in the form of biomass, right? You are burning stuff, essentially. Might be wood, might be peat, might be other kinds of things. 
essentially mankind building or sorry burning uh, that biomass uh, and uh, you know for the basic necessities of life right and those are um, you know keeping people warm cooking food providing light etc um, and it really wasn't until all the way out in 1850 where you begin to see some of this change happening so 1859 was the was the Titusville Pennsylvania oil strike it was the first oil found in the U.S. At the time, no one knew there was any oil anywhere else in the world, uh, but that began, as you can see, just beginning to introduce other kinds of fuels into the energy mix. Um, maybe a second big point might have been in 1925. You're still pretty early, as you can see at that point in time. Uh, most of the energy around the world is still provided by that biomass. Um, so it might be wood. You're probably bringing in you know, whale oil, et cetera, at that point, but coal and oil begin to begin to play a role. Uh, and it starts accelerating pretty quickly at that point because we've went from that place of having an oil strike to you know, 50 some years later, actually putting a long distance pipeline in. You can start to you know, get energy from where you get it out of the ground to where it's needed. Uh, another big, uh, another big uh, kind of point in history was 25 years after that. So uh, a, very, you know, a very long natural gas pipeline from Gulf Coast um, to Pennsylvania and New York. Uh, this really begins the rapid transition uh, of, of, of energy sources. You can see beginning to introduce at that point uh, natural gas, which is in purple uh, on the graph here today. Um, then just a few years later, 19, 1954, the first nuclear reactor is connected to the grid, uh, actually in Soviet Union. Um, uh, so a lot of people think it happened in the U.S., but uh, it happened in the Soviet Union. The first uh, U.S. site uh, that uh, existed purely for uh, grid power wasn't until three or four years after that uh, in New York, I believe. Then 1980s, uh, probably within the, the you know the, the life of most folks here uh, on our meeting today. Uh, so you may be able to remember some of these things, but the first utility scale wind farms uh, installed in California. Uh, and then just a year after that, the first megawatt scale solar plant uh, goes online in California. So I highlight these things just to give you some perspective on how new some of this change is. And the world, um, the world of energy remains static for very, very long periods of time. And we began this, this pivot to a massive transition, you know, in the lifetimes of most of the people that, that are on the meeting here today. Another kind of instructive way I think to look at this is this view. Essentially, this is the same graph, um, but it's it's we're presenting the data in a little bit different way. Uh, there's two Y axes here. The left Y axis is the percent of energy uh, and the right Y axis is the total global energy use. So the last slide we saw was just the total global energy use. And you could see how there was some transition going on, but it was kind of hard to see exactly how much. So no big surprise from the, you know, from what we just reviewed that, you know, all the way out until, you know, those early 1900s and you get the pipelines going in 1920 period, that this is really a story of biomass. Uh, you then have, um, you know, coal and oil really beginning to take off. Um, you know, you might say, well, why, you know, what, what's going on here? Why are we using so much more energy? There are several different reasons. So in general, energy is correlated, energy consumption is correlated to two things. Um, it is GDP. So the more industrialized your, um, your country is, you're going to use more energy. And energy is also generally correlated to your population. So we've had, you know, population growth over that time. So what's been going on, you start to get a feel for this, is that total energy consumed is moving up very quickly. Um, especially in less developed countries. What you'll find over time is that as a company, or I'm sorry, as a country uh, becomes more developed, uh, its energy per GDP and energy per population actually begins to flatten out a little, uh, little bit. So here in the US, we're not moving quite as quickly. We can add GDP and add people without doing that. If you're looking at a developing country, Africa, Southeast Asia, et cetera, you're gonna have to have a lot of energy to support that GDP growth and other things. But something that really jumps out here, I think I'll point out a couple of things. Um, if you look at the far right side of that x-axis, so that's the year 2046, so it's roughly 2050 out there. And I think an interesting thing to kind of get your mind around is that if, if you think globally, 
Uh, and you look at the energy sources. Uh, sure, we're not using as much biomass as before. Uh, yes, coal production is going to go down quite a bit. Um, oil production is uh, oil energy uh, is is going to be reducing a little bit. Natural gas is going to continue to build even by the year 2050. 80 percent, you know, roughly 80 out of the 120 terawatt hours uh, is provided by fossil fuels. So we hear a lot about solar and wind, and clearly uh, you can see the, the the colors up there. The wind being that kind of pinkish color and solar being uh, yellow. Clearly those are growing very quickly, but we're still going to be living in a world in the foreseeable future where fossil fuels are a real and meaningful part of the energy equation, especially in that developing world. Maybe here in the U.S. we see solar and wind taking much larger shares than this, but when we think about world consumption, it's just an important point because it's really going to kind of kind of uh, really come to the uh, the, 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 the focus of why things are changing and what technologies are important. We're going to dig in each of those um, here in just a little bit. So the way I want you to think about this, this presentation we're going to go through is, you know, the story of where we are today, right? Fossil fuels, when you combust them, um, they're great at creating light. They create that heat to keep us warm and they can cook food. You can directly, you know, burn a fossil fuel and do all three of those things. The challenge, of course, is, is that they're not renewable. Uh, at some point, we're going to run out of those. Uh, they're going to be harder to get to, more expensive. Uh, and um, while we do this, we are causing harm to our planet. So we've got this situation with fossil fuels today that we've got to find something new. Um, and those new things have been developing, as we've seen since roughly the you know, 1950s, 60s, 70s. And that's really been the integration of uh, you know, nuclear energy in the 1950s and then uh, uh, solar and wind in the 1980s and on. And of course, those are growing very quickly. Um, however, there's some challenges with those things, right? It's not so easy to take a solar panel and, you know, cook your lunch today or a wind, wind panel or a, a wind farm to, to keep you warm today. And certainly using a nuclear reactor in your house to do either one of those things is very difficult. So they're not a perfect substitute for these other fossil fuels. And so it creates a challenge. How do we think about solving that? The great thing, the catalyst for really the substitution of fossil fuels is electricity. Electricity is that mechanism that is going to allow us to displace fossil fuel consumption with things that either A, are greener, or B, might have a lower cost to operate. So if you think about solar and wind, um, there's no marginal fuel cost, right? You're not paying per photon um, or gust of wind for incremental energy versus coal, gas, and oil. You've got to pay uh, to get that fossil fuel out of the ground. That zero marginal fuel, fuel, uh, fuel cost um, has the real possibility to reduce energy costs for everyone around the world. But of course, there's a challenge in that um, the sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow all the time, and it's very hard to site nuclear reactors. And so you've got a fundamental challenge. So great, we can, we've got this electrical grid mechanism to put these two things together. In theory, that helps, but they're not perfect players. So we need something else. And that something else is what we're really going to focus our presentation on today. And that are the enablers. What are the things that really help um, these greener energy sources displace fossil fuels um, that will, in doing so, create a world and we're providing access to energy for more people. We're providing better energy security. Um, potentially, we're lowering the cost of, of electricity. We're providing better resilience and we're doing so in a way that doesn't cause harm to our planet. So those three enablers on the bottom where we're going to focus on the far left is carbon capture. Um, as we just saw from that graph, Fossil fuels are going to be with us for the next 20, 30 years. We're going to use them. If we're going to use them, how can we use them in a way that is more beneficial to this world? How can we think about removing some of those harmful uh, elements that, that result from the combustion of fossil fuel? Carbon capture is part of that story. We're going to talk about it today. The next thing is hydrogen. Hydrogen uh, is something that is going to have a pretty profound effect on the world. Um, I'm going to talk about that next. Uh, and it, it really, it, it, it touches everything about our lives. 
And the final thing is energy storage, of which hydrogen is part of, but, but energy storage mechanisms outside of that as well. Those three things, um, carbon capture, hydrogen, and energy storage, are going to allow us to more fully embrace those disruptive energy sources to create that greener, more resilient, lower cost grid that's providing power to more people around the world. There's still almost a billion people without access to electricity and around 1.5 billion that have access to only intermittent energy. Um, for those economies to grow, to provide a better quality of life, that's gonna have to be, uh, that's gonna have to be addressed. These enablers are, are gonna be key to that. So with no further ado, let's, let's kind of begin with hydrogen. So why is hydrogen so important? Well, um, fossil fuels are, are, are made up of hy hydrocarbons. I don't know if we've got any, you know, chemical engineers on the phone, but uh, CH4, right? That is, that is the uh, chemical symbol for methane, right? So one, one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms come together to form this. Of course, uh, if you talked about a gasoline or an ethanol, those are also hydrocarbon change. Um, they've got more C's and more H's. Uh, but in general, they're kind of the same idea. You've got carbons and hydrogens coming together. Um, hydrogen is, a, is, is the fundamental part of that that provides uh, energy. Um, hydrogen is also extremely key to our food supply in this world. Um, ammonia, NH3, that's one nitrogen atom and three hydrogen atoms. It's a fertilizer that's the precursor to 45% of the world's food. Without, without ammonia um, that uh, today uh, is mostly synthetically created, in other words, it's created via a process we'll talk about called the Haber-Bosch process, it results in almost half of the world's food today. Um, the population growth around the world that, that we've had, the economic benefits would not have been possible without, uh, without the creation of ammonia and a ways to do that in synthetic fashions. And finally, water, right? So water is the basis uh, of the fluids of all living organisms. Uh, and clearly you see uh, a couple of hydrogen atoms uh, in there. So hydrogen is at the center of this energy, food, water nexus. When you start thinking about using hydrogen for one purpose or not using it for another purpose, um, it's important that you don't lose sight on how, uh, on how it interrelated it is to these different elements. We'll dig into that just a little bit deeper here. Let's begin with this idea of hydrogen as an energy carrier. Um, that H2O, it's got those two hydrogen atoms. It so happens that if we apply electricity to hydrogen or to, to water, H2O, we call that electrolysis. When we, when we apply electricity to water, we separate or crack the hydrogen and oxygen molecules and you can create hydrogen on its own. Now, you might hear about colors of hydrogen, which we're going to talk about. You might hear green, gray, pink, turquoise, et cetera. The color of that hydrogen, it actually doesn't look a different color, <laughs> but uh, how we call it uh, in terms of um, our, our kind of, you know, we, we use that color scheme to help describe how it was made. Uh, the source of the electricity, it's what's going to be the uh, pri primary determinant on the color of that hydrogen. And so we'll, we'll dig into that in just a second. Let's look at the second process, right? So the second process is that methane, it, let's say CH4 or any hydrocarbon. We can combust that hydrocarbon to make electricity. So the arrow goes down that direction. Or there are processes, SMR, that's short for steam methane reformation. You can apply steam to a methane mo uh, molecule and it will crack that and create hydrogen. So you can see that once again, that interaction between the fossil fuel, electricity and water is already forming here. Now let's look on the right. Let's bring food into the equation. When we have that hydrogen, we can, we can apply that process, the Haber-Bosch process to create ammonia and together with water, that's vital for food, okay? And then let's take this one step farther. If we create hydrogen from a green source, and we capture CO2, which we'll get into that here in just a little bit, um, we can create a synthetic molecule, a synthetic hydrocarbon using something called the Fischer-Tropsch process um, that will allow you to create green fuels of the future. So when you start hearing about synthetic jet fuel or green jet fuel or things like this, this is one of the process that people are talking about to go do that. So you can see how these things are very much interrelated as uh, 
uh, you know, the food, electricity, uh, and uh, the different processes that allow us to create different power sources come together. So let's talk about some of those different colors. Um, if we begin with fossil fuels, so a pathway, if we burn fossil fuels and we use electrolysis, you're going to create one of two things. If you capture the carbon when you do that, so we talked about if you if you do electrolysis, um, you crack apart the carbon, uh, you know, you crack apart the carbon from the hydrogen. If you capture that 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 carbon that combines with oxygen, then that's considered blue hydrogen. So you've created hydrogen, but you've captured the carbon, so you've contained the environmental attributes. If you don't do that, it's called gray hydrogen. Most hydrogen today is gray hydrogen. So that hydrogen that's used to produce ammonia, uh, if you ever go to ammonia plant, a lot of that is you know gray hydrogen and therefore gray ammonia. There's another process um, that uh, allows you to crack apart a, um, a fossil fuel without combustion. Uh, and some of this uh, goes through a process, but it's another kind of hydrogen called turquoise hydrogen. Uh, and really what that, what that allows you to do is, is um, it designates that, that that process hasn't resulted in the creation of nitrous oxide and, and sulfur dioxide, et cetera. So these things mean, someone, mean something to someone that wants to decarbonize their solutions or lower their carbon footprint or be more environmentally responsible. So people are going to pay attention to what these things are. Now, if we're using nuclear energy to do that electrolysis instead of fossil fuel, that designation is called pink hydrogen. So nuclear energy um, would have a very, 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 very low um, CO2 content, if any. There's, you know, there's some, uh, perhaps there's a small amount. If you do a calculation, everything went to it, there's some. But this is a very, very, very low carbon. So pink, pink hydrogen uh, is a very carbon friendly source of hydrogen. The most carbon friendly is going to be using renewable energy to create that hydrogen. And there's a couple process there. You can take a, um, you can take um, uh, solar or wind. You can use that electricity through an electrolyzer uh, to create that hydrogen. Or there's some other direct processes that I'm not going to get into today. But essentially, it's imagine using biomass and things like this. So these are the different kinds of hydrogen. Hi, is that Simon? Yeah. Hi, Simon. Uh, my name is Jay. I'm going from Cubic. Uh, we spoke a little while ago via email. Um, I sent you over some CVs. You just said you'd uh, take a look at them and be in touch. I just wanted to uh, touch base and see if they were of interest at all. Oh, Jay? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure about that. So uh, why don't we talk about that one offline, okay? All right. Let's, uh, let's talk about some of this electrolysis technology. Um, okay, not to worry. Yeah. Um, so there are different yeah. types of electrolysis, um, le alkaline, PEM, and solid oxide. Yeah, that's they absolutely fine. Yeah, I'll drop you uh, an email over tomorrow. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, apologies. All right, hey, could, yeah, please, let's uh, let's hold questions like that until, until afterwards. Um, so different types of electrolysis technologies um, and the, the, the three of the most common kinds, alkaline, it's been around a long time. Um, the downside is it's not very efficient. So you notice the efficiency is um, 70%. Um, and this can be a challenge. I want you to think about, uh, imagine that you are going to use, you know, solar or wind, that precious green energy in order to make hydrogen. Um, you've already you've already got a pretty significant capacity factor reduction because obviously doesn't wind doesn't blow all the time sun doesn't shine all the time so you know if 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 you uh, create a megawatt of solar energy um, you may only have a net 250 kW of of solar electricity actually created because of that three quarter three quarters of the day roughly that you can't get you know a lot of solar energy out of that. If you then use and apply um, alkaline electrolysis to that, you're losing another 30% of that. And so it, it really results in a scenario, scenario where you're squandering a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, renewable energy that you have. Um, a newer, uh, but, 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 it, but it is an industrial mature. There, there, there is alkaline electrolysis around the world today. It's one of the most common mechanisms to make it. A new, one newer technology is called PEM. Um, and PEM technology, 
um, creates a little more efficiency. A challenge to Pen uh, uh, Electros, however, is that it uses some rare metals, uh, platinum group metals, things like this that can be hard to get. Um, and uh, and therefore it's it got some of those downsides, Al you know, alkaline only had nickel and steel alloys, et cetera. Solid oxide electrolysis um, is really the, the tip of the spear in terms of um, where this market's going. As you can see, it's extremely efficient, 90 to 100% efficient, um, and it uses pretty common materials, nickel and ceramic, et cetera. So this is something that, that my company has spent a lot of time focusing on, this idea of solid oxide electrolysis. So let's dig into that. Um, what this platform is. So what you're looking at on the right is a, um, is a solution that uh, will create around 600 kilograms a day of hydrogen. Uh, and uh, it can do that with 100% electrical efficiency. In other words, the energy um, that, you know, that precious energy that comes from your uh, solar field or your wind field or even a nuclear reactor that goes into it, um, we don't lose anything in the conversion of hydrogen if waste heat is available. If it's not available, a solid oxide electrolyzer will still be 92% efficient. So you are extremely efficient. You're losing very little in this process. So if you think about creating hydrogen at scale, solid oxide electrolysis can be extremely important. Something I'll come back to in just a moment is this platform is also capable of operating in reverse. Um, instead of just making hydrogen, hydrogen can be fed back into it to create electricity. And so if you put those two things together, creating hydrogen, storing it, and then running the hydrogen back through it to create electricity, you've created long duration storage, which is one of those other disruptors we'll get to in just a second. Um, hydrogen uh, and the global green hydrogen uh, supply chain um, is, a, um, is a market that is building extremely fast today. What you're looking at is um, the difference between where you can make hydrogen for very, very low costs and where it's needed. So where are the places that it's needed today? Hydrogen is needed in places that don't have good, good energy security. One example of that might be Europe, where their natural gas supplies are being throttled by Russia. Um, augmenting the natural gas supply in Europe with hydrogen can improve energy security for Europe. There's also countries like Korea, Japan, et cetera, that don't have a lot of fossil fuels. So they don't have that same autonomy. So you can imagine that, how do we think about it? But, but some of those places like Korea and Japan, you can see there, they don't have a lot of room. It's, it's not so easy to put a gigawatt of solar to make that green hydrogen. So you've got to think about a world in which you're making hydrogen somewhere and then getting it somewhere else. And that's what this, uh, that's what this graph is representing. You can see that in places like Chile, Northern Africa, um, the Cape of South Africa, Middle East, uh, some of Australia, there are going to be places where green energy is created and it will be shipped in the form of hydrogen, um, likely bundled within a molecule like ammonia uh, to be used and unpacked and used for energy in those other countries. So um, and as you can see, by 2030, the demand of this is going to increase by 76 million tons. So this is a market that's building very, very, very fast. So we see a world in which production will be large and centralized, probably in places like Australia, Middle East, North Africa, Chile, um, and it will be used in those energy constrained areas, Europe, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, for power production, gas pipelines, steel, fertilizer, et cetera. But you've got to get it from one place to the other, and this, this also creates some challenges. The transportation of hydrogen today in liquid format isn't, isn't at scale. You can't go look at a bunch of people doing this today. The market is still nascent. There may be a liquid H2 market in the future, but today people are thinking about instead of transporting it as liquid H2, you actually take and create ammonia or even custom molecules um, that, uh, you know, some hydrocarbon chain or some, you know, uh, chains of nitrogen and um, uh, uh, oxygen and, and, and hydrogen um, could be, you know, uh, methanol, et cetera, to go and transport this. The, the transportation of ammonia, methanol, and even LNG in the form of synthetic gases is much better understood. There's ships that do that today. There's people that handle all that today. And, uh, and so they represent excellent transportation mechanisms. So this idea of production, usage, transportation 
This is the ecosystem that is being built up today at massive scale. So just today, um, we had a major announcement, which was uh, we had we have uh, entered into an MOU with Malaysia Marine and Heavy Engineering. Uh, 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 MMHE is a subsidiary of Petronas, which is the Malaysian national oil company. Um, they are in the business today. You can kind of see this is one of their shipyards, but they construct um, uh, large uh, offshore oil rigs and others. So they're very, very large. Um, this is the kind of scale that it's going to take to construct these electrolysis plants because that one illustration I had up there was a, a one megawatt plant. Some of these plants that will be constructed to create this green hydrogen at scale will be hundreds of megawatts or even gigawatts. So um, this is an example of how we think that collaboration in this market is going to be important to, um, you know, to solve that problem of getting hydrogen where it can be made to where it needs to be used. You can read about that today in the news. Um, another important uh, use case we see is the coupling of electrolysis and nuclear. So here we're doing work with Idaho National Laboratories, uh, which is uh, one of the national laboratories in the U.S. that's very much focused on nuclear, especially small modular nuclear. And um, we are today testing electrolysis that will use that waste heat from a nuclear reactor. You may have seen a couple months ago, we announced a, um, a project in Ukraine uh, in which we are partnered with a company uh, to create green ammonia for Ukraine and that ammonia to be used for um, agriculture, et cetera. Uh, but we think this idea of nuclear plus electrolysis is going to be um, uh, a very, very big market. And this market will be in places like North America. So this is Canada, US, Europe, you know, France that has a lot of nuclear. So it's not just a story of far flung parts of the world. It's a story of co-locating with nuclear here in North America. And there's a couple different business models. One, one model is where you put the electrolyzers next to a large nuclear reactor. Um, the other business model is that you would put an electrolyzer where the hydrogen is going to be used, like maybe a steel plant. And then that steel plant would buy a, a strip of um, clean power from a nuke plant via some kind of virtual power purchase agreement. So we see both of those markets. So for people here focused on the U.S., um, thinking about nuclear PPAs or solar and wind PPAs, coupling that with distributed hydrogen production for steel, for um, transportation, and for cement, et cetera, um, we expect to see those opportunities and are beginning to see some today. So I alluded to the fact of energy storage. I'm going to go quickly through this. You can imagine if you've got an electrolyzer that's making hydrogen, and then you can pull that hydrogen back out to make electricity. Essentially, you've created um, what is a long duration energy storage. So that's the focus of um, you know, our solid oxide platform. The only reactant's water, right? So you take the water, we put the green energy into it, it creates green hydrogen, we store it, we pull the green hydrogen back out, we put we put that green energy back on the grid. The hydrogen, or sorry, the water is created during that power production process, goes back into the tank. So you've kind of got this um, this loop uh, creating long duration storage with, with uh, water being the only reactant. This is what it looks like. Uh, so you, you can see that the fuel cell, um, a water storage tank, hydrogen storage tank, and uh, this uh, solid oxide stack operating in um, both electrolyzer mode and fuel cell mode. So this is something we think is going to have a pretty profound impact because of this graph on the left. As you may know, most grid scale energy storage today is in the form of lithium ion. And lithium ion makes a lot of sense for short duration windows. When you're talking about a you know a, a 15 minute, 30 minute, one hour, two hours, even four hour windows, lithium ion is going to be a cost effective way to go deliver, but is uh, deliver that flexibility to the market. But as you can see with this graph, once you start getting beyond four hours, um, the price of building on lithium ion, you don't get much uh, cost savings. When you think about building out long duration storage with hydrogen and water. Because water is the only reactant, it becomes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to go get that storage. So when you start thinking about, you know, these long duration storage windows, um, we believe that hydrogen storage is going to have the ability to deliver some of the lowest cost, if not the lowest cost flexibility in the markets today. So this is something that we're spending a lot of time on. 
Let's finally talk about, so we talked about hydrogen, we talked about storage, and what's that, that third vector is, uh, is carbon capture. Um, so let's maybe begin by talking about where do emissions come from, uh, and probably no big surprise, they come from power generation, and they come from industrial stuff. So you've got pulp and paper refining, ammonia creation, coal plants, ethanol plants, et cetera, manufacturing. So, you know, when these companies and many, you know, you can imagine many Fortune 1000 companies are playing in these markets, um, they're increasingly taking on ESG goals. Um, those goals are going to require them to minimize their emissions. Um, they've got a pretty big challenge because some of these are really big emitters, right? So how do they go think about doing that? Um, good news is, is you can, you know, you can, you can get uh, green energy PPAs and take care of some of this challenge. But especially these industries that require heat to do things, there's a lot of local gas usage. There's a lot of local energy usage, and those things are very hard to abate. So we really focused on how do we attack that? How do we decarbonize at the point of emission some of these difficult segments that are using heat in their process? And we use a, a solution that is based upon that molten carbonate fuel cell that we've had in the market for a long time. Uh, and, the, you know, at a very high level, there's, uh, I'd be happy to show you, there's a whole bunch of equations on how this works, but uh, for you chemies out there, but for most of us, this should, this should be about enough. Essentially, you can imagine you bring methane in. Um, so this is natural gas or it's biogas. Um, and you bring in air on the cathode. Instead of just pure air, though, you bring in the flue gas of that natural gas boiler, of that steam generator, maybe of a coal plant. Um, throughout this process, through that elect electrochemical process, that CO2 um, that was in that emission stream is concentrated and it's captured, okay? At the same time, this unit is also creating electricity and it's water positive. It's actually creating water. Now there's ways to go and um, capture uh, CO2 today, um, amine scrubber, some of you may be familiar with, et cetera. Um, those solutions, they use a lot of electricity and they use a lot of water. Uh, so we think this kind of solution where we're using a molten carbonate fuel cell to go do this, um, is going to deliver some pretty incredible returns. So let's go ahead and think about how you might look at those returns. So um, let's imagine that uh, you know you are going to deploy a uh, a a, few, a a carbon capture platform. We call it the SureSource uh, platform. That's going to cost some money. You're going to have to buy some natural gas to go into it, um, but you're going to create power, and that power is going to be sold back to the grid or used. Um, and in doing so, you actually massively reduce the cost of capture today. So um, if, uh, if you can, uh, you know, uh, provide power in a place that has a, um, you know, let's say anywhere above about nine, 10, 10 cent power, this is going to be a much cheaper way to go capture that carbon at the same time providing better resilience because you've got a generation source there. So this is something um, that we're really uh pushing into the market right now. Let's look at a specific case study, and that's the food processing industry. So in the food processing industry, there's kind of three major sources or three major applications for CO2. Food, which we're going to dig into in a second. Beverages. Um, so you can imagine, you know, your Budweiser beer, your Coca-Cola, use a lot of CO2 and dry ice for shipment and other things. Um, we're specifically going to talk about the meat processing industry today. Stuns animals, use CO2. It's a humane way of, of killing animals. Um, it's used to keep products cold during transportation, and it's also used to cool meat products and equipment during processing. When you are, you know, when you are grinding, cutting, doing things with meat, it builds up a lot of heat, uh, which results in problems with the product. So um, the food processing uh, industry is very dependent upon CO2. And today, there's few viable alternatives to replace the CO2. So they're, they're stuck kind of have to using CO2. Uh, furthermore, the cost of CO2 is on the rise due to COVID. People weren't driving as much. Therefore, ethanol production went down. Some of those plants never started back up. Ethanol was the largest source, one of the largest sources of CO2 creation prior to COVID. And then on top of that, vaccine storage transportations create a new demand for CO2. So there's more demand for CO2, fewer people producing it. The price of natural gas has went way up, uh, which means that it's more expensive to create CO2 when you're creating fertilizer, things like that. 
And all, there's also been contaminations uh, in some of the largest natural CO2 um, reservoirs in the world. So if you look up CO2 contamination, you'll find that there's been uh, this Jackson Dome. There's other examples of a lot of contamination of benzene. So it's naturally occurring sources are being diminished quickly. And finally, regulation and policy. So you recall that um, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, one of the mandates in that is that the U.S., federal government will provide $85 per ton of subsidy for sequestering that CO2. So if you're making CO2 today um, and you can put it in the ground and get paid $85 a ton, you're not going to sell it to anyone else for less than that. So what that did was raise the floor price of CO2 to $85 a ton, where in the past, low cost applications might have been $10, $20, $30 a ton, et cetera. So this is really creating a place where the CO2 market's on the rise. So we are working on application with a food processor. This would be a typical benefit for someone like that. We're using that SureSource platform. Um, in doing so, we're delivering a couple million dollars, almost $3 million of savings, 30, $34 million net present value over 20 years. We're capturing 84% of the CO2 from their on-site boilers, helping their, um, really helping their ESG goals. Um, I didn't mention it, but... Uh, a uh, leveraging a fuel sulfur decarbonization reduces nitrous oxide of the emissions as well, um, which can reduce um, some of their um, siting requirements, make it easier to operate. Uh, in the case of this, uh, could somebody go on mute, please? Thanks. Um, there is, uh, uh, we're creating that beverage grade CO2 for this food processor, securitizing their supply, 54 tons a day, creating base load power, um, which is available if the grid goes off for increased resilience. We're providing heat out of this, uh, which is actually reducing some of their boiler load and um, creating water, uh, 1,440 gallons a day. Uh, and most people, ESG goals have water reduction. So a ton of different benefits. Um, and this is why we think carbon capture is such a practical way as part of these enablers. I'm going to finish with uh, one, uh, one, uh, one case study. And this is the port of Long Beach. Uh, so this plant is uh, in final construction today. It's actually in um, uh, the commissioning phase today. And so this is a process by which you're bringing everything up online. It takes a couple months. Um, but uh, the way this operates is that um, you bring natural gas, in this case, renewable biogas fuel as the input to it. Um, this site will create 2.35 megawatts of uh, green power because we're using renewable biogas as the input. Um, we're creating um, some thermal energy, which I'll talk about how we're using that in a minute. We're creating 1,270 kilograms of hydrogen per day and 1,400 gallons of water per day. So let's talk about how the port's using that. So I'm going to stop sharing this. And I think we're going to have to share something else here. Let me... Uh... Maybe Ashley, you can confirm you can see this. Yes, we can. Thank you. Awesome. So this is the Port of Long Beach. So you may know that California Air Resources Board has mandated that um, ships that enter into California ports must shut down. And that's because in the past, those ships were you know running on bunker fuel, number six fuel oil, uh, belching, you know, all kind of nasty stuff into the air flowing back into LA and those areas. Port of Long Beach is one of the largest container ports in the world. Um, so those ports have a lot higher energy demand than they ever did before because each of these ships, these container ships that pull in, they can be anywhere from one megawatt to 10 megawatts of load. So first of all, they need that extra electricity. So having a platform that creates electricity is important for them. The second thing is, is that the Port of Long Beach realized they had another problem. Great news is they shut the ships down, but now you had all these trucks that were sitting there idling, waiting to pick up their loads, their container loads, and they're burning diesel, right? Number two. And uh, they're like, well, this isn't great. So now we got these little, all these little diesel, you know, diesel trucks idling. Why don't we think about how to go and decarbonize those? And so the Port of Long Beach, uh, together with Toyota and a company called Packar, uh, you may not know that name Packard, but you probably know a couple of their brands. Uh, one is with Peterbilt and one's Kenworth. 
um, they have implemented a Toyota hydrogen fuel cell into their trucks. There eventually will be about 12 of these trucks here at this port over the next couple of years. Um, and they, uh, there, will be a com there will come a time when the Port of Long Beach will no longer allow um, diesel trucks to, to come into port. They're experimenting with hydrogen for long haul. They're experimenting with battery trucks for short haul, uh, but they are really looking at this. So this port, in addition um, to being a place where uh, they're decarbonizing trucks, it's also the place that Toyota imports their Mirai hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. So um, when that comes into port, uh, when those when those when those cars come into port, they need to be um, filled up with hydrogen. So they needed some hydrogen. So the port needed electricity. Toyota needed hydrogen. Another benefit is this this what you're seeing this logistics service center. This is where they badge all these vehicles. So when they come over, they don't have the emblems and you know spoilers and all those other things that happens at these facilities. They also need to wash these vehicles before they go out. So hot water was something they also have um, a need for. So the uh, the little the two little buildings over that you can see on the right those are um, those are places where um, they they wash vehicles and other things. So the solution that we are deploying at the port of Long Beach creates electricity um, that is fed back into the grid that helps supply the port. We create hydrogen that Toyota is using both for the Mirai fuel cell vehicle and also for those uh, Kenworth trucks that are being um, converted to hydrogen today. Uh, you can see in the future, there's a couple things in the back, a shell filling station. So um, we make a little more hydrogen than Toyota actually needs. And so this will be made available to other people that need hydrogen in the area. Uh, and uh, let's go ahead and dig into the plant now uh, of how this plant operates. So uh, we begin by uh, the biogas is fed into the plant, uh, and uh, it then is combined with hot water, the saturation phase. And what this does is when you, uh, I mentioned it before, steam methane reformation, when you put hot steam together with methane, you crack apart the, um, the, the, the carbon, uh, which combines with oxygen to create CO2 uh, from hydrogen. The hydrogen, the whole, the whole process is then heated, hydrogen is released, the hydrogen goes into the fuel cell to create electricity, but we don't need all the hydrogen there. So once it's in the stack, it creates some of those, it creates the electricity in a DC format that is then inverted to AC to go back on the grid in this part of the uh, solution here. Um, and uh, then at that point, as it exhausts from the fuel stack, uh, it is cooled back down in that process. Water is released. That's where you get those 1,400 gallons of water a day. And finally, um, some of the hydrogen, that 1,440 kilograms of hydrogen a day is, uh, is pulled off. It goes through a purification process to get it to transportation grade and is uh, then moved into the moved into storage to put into uh, those Toyota uh, Mirai and those Kenworth uh, truck details. So this is a plant that, uh, like as I mentioned, will be coming online within the next two months. Uh, so you'll be hearing a lot more about this, but we think this is kind of an innovative way to show that hydrogen creation decarbonization story. So with that, we've got 10 minutes left. So I'm going to stop sharing this and uh, we're going to go to, to Q&A and wrap up here. So um, I don't know how you'd like to proceed, but... Uh, uh, I can help. <laughs> However you want to do it. Sounds good. We did have a question come in. Um, what is the cost of that poor project, I think, specifically? Yeah, so the way you think about it, there's different components of that. So uh, because there was different off-takers, the, the costs were kind of broken up. So, for example, if you're just thinking about the price of power, um, that's not counting the hydrogen you're selling. So it kind of stacked up the entire value of the of, of, of the solution was, you know, somewhere in the 30, you know, 30 million dollar range is, is roughly where it was at. But not all that capex went to just creating electricity or just creating hydrogen. Uh, it was divided up into those different elements. So you can't really compare it, you know, to, hey, what would a what would a gas engine cost there or something? Instead, we tend to think about what's the net present value, what's the value of the hydrogen that's created, what's the value of electricity that's created. Thank you. I don't think there were any additional questions. Um, 
another question that came in that was just kind of administrative. We will be providing um, the link to download and rewatch this video at any time, as well as a link um, to the presentation, and that will be available on centuriontechnologies.com. So did you have any um, final comments um, that you'd like to address, Mark? Just like to thank everyone for joining today. And uh... Uh, certainly uh, feel free to reach out if you'd like to discuss uh, more depth and thank you to Centurion and Ashley, thank you for uh, putting this on. Thank you all so much for your time today. Um, we won't take up any more. We do have, oh, I'm sorry, there is a question that is coming in. It's being typed right now. Uh -huh. um, and as we're uh, kind of a, waiting for that to come in, we do have another presentation coming up in March. We'll also include the link to register um, for the Zoom link to attend that one as well. And the topic will be EV charging. Um, so that is definitely one you might wanna keep on your radar. Um, the question is, and this might be one that maybe you take offline, uh, Mark, but how can we pitch the port project to Jabal Ali Free Zone port in Dubai? Yeah, we think we think this port, uh, I'll just answer right now by saying this, we think this port project is highly, it's going to be highly repeatable. Um, this is something that that a lot of ports are looking for. There's not great answers out there today. It's pretty novel in its approach. Um, we're just completing the first one literally the last couple months. And so, um, you know, having this in the ground, having a place where you can bring, you know, the stakeholders from from Dubai and everywhere else in the world um, will be important. So, um, yes, very interested in figuring out how to go do that. And, um, you know, we're beginning to open those dialogues now that we're, we're finishing the project up. This is an exciting time. Thank you so very much, everyone. Um, thank you, Mark, for putting this presentation together. Um, again, it's available on our Facebook page, Centurion Technologies. Um, it will be available on our website under news. Um, everyone who attended today will be receiving a um, copy via um, email. So thank you all for your time, and we hope to see you in March. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.